Hi everyone, um, my name is Oda and I am a sound and music designer from Norway and I will be talking about working with AI as a co-composer and uh, among the audio community this is quite a controversial subject to a lot of people. Um, are there anyone working with audio here by the way? Cool, hi. <laughs> um, so what I will be covering in this talk is first a brief introduction to what algorithmic music is and a bit of history. Then I'll talk a bit about where music and AI is at today. I'll show you a list of tools that are currently available. Um, and I'll talk a bit about how I work myself. And then I'll finish off by talking a bit about the future and what I think will be well, the case in a few years and even after that. So, what exactly is algorithmic music? Um, the definition of an algorithm is um, an algorithm is a set of rules or a sequence of operations designed to accomplish a task or solve a problem. And using this definition, sheet music or using music notation to create music could actually be considered an algorithmic approach. But when we talk about algorithmic music, we usually don't talk about that. We talk about music created with non-human inputs. For example, dice. And in the 1700s in Western Europe, it was very popular to use dice to determine the order in which pre-composed snippets of music would be played. And this form of randomization is still used a lot today, also in um, game music. Um, but when we talk about more modern and contemporary algorithmic music, we usually talk about using computers to create the music. And the first, probably the first uh, mention of using computers to create music was by Ada Lovelace, uh, who was a British data pioneer and com um, a programmer. And in 1842, she, ha she had a really great quote, which was quite long, so I summarized it. Um, if notation and pitch can be affected and controlled by a computer, it should be able to compose music of any degree of complexity. And that was more than a hundred years before the first uh, piece of music composed by a computer was created. Um, and that was in 1957 by the Iliac Computer. It was a um, string quartet um, very contemporary sounding. I'm not going to show an example right now because I don't have time, unfortunately. Um, but that was created by the Iliac computer with the aid of the composers and professors Hiller and Isaacson. And this was a really huge breakthrough, but since it was a long time ago, it sounded very um, random to us. And that's not what we usually want these days when we use computers to create music. So. Let's move on to where we are at today. AI, or using machine learning. Um, computers have gotten really good at uh, creating music that is rule-based, such as classical music, um, and also ambient music, because very often just pads and maybe a recording of some birds or waves or something. However, when it comes to more complicated music where there is a lot of um, harmonic uh, theory and uh, advanced chord progressions such as in jazz, it struggles because we humans have a lot of expectations when it comes to how music behaves. And if you don't get that right, we pick it up quite easily, but we can't often really place our finger on what exactly is wrong. And that is also why it's not very good at contemporary popular music, because in this kind of music, the overall mix and sound and production is often way more important than the underlying composition. So without further ado, I'll show you some examples of music that has been created by AI. This first one is by a company called Juke Deck, and they are focusing on content creators that want cheaper solutions uh, for music for their videos. Yeah, 
show you one more example from them. Uh, So I think it sounds pretty good, but it's kind of flat. And at least to me, it's not super inspiring. Um, and this is in what I think. It's probably because the music that Juke Deck creates is based off of already existing music. And so it can't really create anything that sounds super revolutionary. Um, but for background music for videos, I'm sure this works more than well enough. Um, and then there's also one called Iva. This is probably the most widely known musical AI available today because it's the one that pops up the most if you go on YouTube and search for AI music. Um, and this right here is more of a, I guess, kind of cinematic orchestral piece. Now that sounds quite a lot better than what Juke Dyke created. Um, and so of course I was kind of curious about how they did this. And it turns out they actually have um, a website where you can use it. So I created an account and I figured we could try it out right now. So we'll just create a track, um, modern cinematic and duration less than 30 seconds. And it usually takes not very long, which I find is really impressive, considering how much time it would have taken me to <laughs> make what we just heard. <laughs> um, okay, let's have a listen. That's actually one of the better ones that it's created. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Um, the thing is um, that what they create is not what you just heard. What they create is MIDI files, and what you get when you use the AI does not sound very good. <laughs> um, it's usually quite muddy, and um, the thing is, uh, the stuff that they put out on YouTube and showcase has been worked on a lot by professionals that work with audio and, s and also the stuff that you hear, in some cases it's been recorded by professional orchestras and in for this one I think they probably used, like you probably know Spitfire Audio, the audio people here, they have really good high quality sample libraries of orchestral instruments and that's probably what's been used here. Um, and so a lot of people who don't know much about music production will think that this has, all of this has been created by AI and that the audio itself is from the AI, but that is not the case. Um, and so both for Juke Deck, which works pretty well, I think, but as I said, it's, it, at least for me, it doesn't sound super inspiring. Um, and also for Iva, you would still need some human input by people who know what they're doing to make it sound actually good. And before I move on to showing you a list of tools that are currently available, I'll address a few of the more common complaints that I've come across uh, during my research for this talk. The first one is, it's not real music. And I think that this is coming from a place where people think that, people has, that music has to be created by humans to be considered real. Um, and also that, I don't know, some people feel like music needs to sound super musical to be music. But the thing is, if you listen to three drops of water 
on loop, it's eventually going to sound like music to you because that's just how our brains work. So th music doesn't have to be super complicated either to actually be music. And uh, coming back to the created by human thing, um, there is a pig called Pig Casso that, <laughs> that paints uh, for charity. And the paintings, are some of them are sold for up to 3,300 euros per piece. <laughs> and so if that's considered art, I think that AI music should also be considered music. Um, <laughs> the next one, uh, it's cheating. And I mean, I kind of get where it's coming from because the idea isn't from you yourself. But as you could hear, you still need to do a lot of work to make it sound good. So I don't think it's fair to say it's cheating. And also, a lot of times, if you are really don't have any inspiration and you're just on the keyboard, blah, 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 um, suddenly something comes out. And I think that's kind of the same as doing something with, with AI. Uh, and the last one is, your musical identity will be lost. And this, yeah. <laughs> Um, this comes from a place, I think, where people are afraid that if they use AI, the music won't sound like or feel like their own anymore. And I totally get this, but then again, artists have been uh, working, collaborating with other artists to create new works for who knows how long. And usually it just results in new and exciting uh, productions. And also that you learn a lot of new skills or get new inspiration. And I think that if we view AI as another thing to just collaborate with, it's going to be really good. And also, if you work with a computer, you don't really have to worry about conflicts because they don't have any opinions. <laughs> so um, here is a list of AIs that are currently available. There are more, I'm sure, but these are the ones that I found the most interesting so far. Um, I won't go into details on this because I don't have time, but some of them are online, some you purchase as a software, um, some are considered AI composers, some are AI-powered uh, tools, and a few of them are just uh, procedurally generating music depending on what mood you want to be in or if you want to focus or sleep and such. Um, personally, I use Orb Composer uh, which is an um, AI-powered composition tool that is developed by a um, company called Hexachords, and I have not been sponsored by them in any way. So w everything I say is my own opinion and from my own experience. Um, this is what the interface looks like. So as you can see, you can choose, uh, just like in any DAW, you have BPM and time signature. You can also choose what key you want, and not just minor or major keys, but also Lydian, Mixolydian, all those other more kind of exotic keys. Uh, you can add whatever instruments you want. It's a bit restrictive, in my opinion, because um, you can't change the names. <laughs> <laughs> and that's <laughs> so there there are a few th things that I don't like about this software, but there are some it can be used for good um and you add these blocks that are um, intro theme transition or endings uh and you just put them like this, and then you can choose uh what kind of block it is uh, the s here means standard, but you also have question answers answer based on question and a new answer. Um, and then you can decide what chords you want for each. You can change time signatures, which is really nice. And you have these parameters called intensity, momentum, and space that determine how much movement there is in the music. And you can also uh, change parameters inside of each instrument block and add and remove them. So for example, you might want the harp to be a melody and maybe piano to play a bass line of some sort, and you can just input that there. So there's quite a lot of stuff you can play around with here, which is quite a lot of fun. Um, and you can have your favorite third-party plugins. <laughs> uh, so you can add whatever instruments you like, and you can add like reverbs and ec like echoes and distortion and whatever you want, but Personally, I don't find it very intuitive, and like I haven't been able to find a good flow for this, so I personally just 
use Orb to generate ideas and then I export the MIDI and put it into my DAW and keep working on it there because I find that that works better for me. But I know that some people like to hook up their DAW to Orb and then they can control stuff through the DAW in. And a DAW is a digital audio workstation, by the way, for those of you who don't know. Um, so that's also an option, but I haven't been able to make that work properly with Logic, which is what I use. Um, so now I think I'll just show you a few examples of, um, it's from a project that I'm currently working on, can't really talk a lot about it, but um, a couple of months ago I created a track that is supposed to be for a nostalgic flashback into your childhood memories. So I added a bunch of instruments that I wanted to have, and I didn't really do much, I just created a block and set it like told Orb, make whatever you want. And this is what it made. Ah. Amazing, right? <laughs> so, um, I, I think I had like five instruments and it decided that just use the harp. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I played around a bit with the uh, different instruments and stuff and this is what I decided to export. That's quite a lot better. Uh, so there's a very clear melody and chord progression and a nice movement, but I still felt like it sounded a bit off compared to what I wanted. So I exported the MIDI, put it into Logic, played a bit more around, changed the instrumentation a little, and here is the final version. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just back to the your identity will be lost thing. Um, even though the AI created the melody and I then took that and worked on it, the melody wouldn't have existed at all if it weren't for the inputs that I made. So, I still feel very much a sense of ownership over everything here. Um, I don't feel like this is not my own creation whatsoever. Um, and I think that if we just change our mindsets a bit about this, then it's going to be easier to approach AI and use it uh, as music and sound designers um, and still not be afraid that we're going to lose ourselves. Um, so now I'll just move on to talking about the future, which to a lot of people in music <laughs> Sounds a bit scary when we know AI can create pretty good stuff. Um, and I'll just move into the big and scary question. Will AI take over our jobs? <laughs> I think that, no, probably not. Because, yeah, we still have to uh, work on the stuff that it generates. And um, it's going to take a long while before AI will be able to especially make sure that mixing sounds good. And there's a lot of, not only with composing, but the uh, production overall with all the plugins you use. There's so much creativity there that AI, I don't know how we would teach it that even, because um, there are no rules. And AI and machine learning usually need some sort of rules. Um, so uh, I still think that we'll see more of it in certain areas though, especially when it comes to content creators. So YouTubers probably gonna use it more because it will, when it's created by AI and it's not stock music that has been created by a human, it's definitely still going to be cheaper than buying stuff that everyone else uses. 
And for that reason, I also think that low-budget films and, and probably games as well, if they just need simple loops, it's gonna use it more there. Student projects, commercials and jingles also probably. And I also think that for background music in stores and other places, that uh, procedurally generated music will be used more. Because then you can, for example, especially maybe in stores, if you really want people to buy a lot of a certain product, you can put on music that is specifically designed to make people buy that one thing. And I also think that for personal use, it's going to be used more for like focus and sleep and other types of mood enhancements in the future. But what about video game music specifically? I think that procedurally generated music will probably be more and more common. It's al already been used in games like sports, and very su successfully so. But the reason it sounds so good is that they had someone who knew music really, really well make uh, help in making the system and making decisions to make sure the soundtrack still sounds like a cohesive whole, and that different players wouldn't get music that was completely different. Because <laughs> if you just let AI do whatever it wants, you have no idea what you're going to get. <laughs> so making sure someone uh, makes sure that you get a good sound palette for the procedural generation is really important. And also setting the rules for how it's going to be generated in the different areas of the game. So you don't end up with something super intense for one player and something that's really, really calm for another one, especially if you have very narrative heavy games. Um, and in any case, I think it's important that we as musicians are collaborating with AI kind of, uh, that we choose to not be afraid of using it just because some people think it's going to take our jobs or that we're afraid of losing ourselves in the process. Um, because using it is going to give us new ideas. It'll be tools to help us create music faster. And in overall, I think that if we just accept that this is something that is coming, that uh, we're going to probably be better off in the future as well, because just as when the digital audio station came in the 90s, a lot of people didn't want to embrace it, and they were left behind. And I think that is something that could happen with AI as well. So just accepting it and adopting it into our, um, I guess, workflows is probably a good thing. And that's all I had for now, so thank you so much.